Hello and welcome to Bench and Movie Club. My name's Ben. You know, you start it every time now. I'll piss off. You do. Listen to the back. Right, go on then, you do. I don't it. care. I'm just saying, you made right. a big song and dance about it. Right. Hi, welcome to Bench and Movie Club. I'm Charlie. My name's Ben. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about Ben's Choice, the 1977 cult classic Abigail's Party, written and directed by Mike Lee. How much have you written? You don't usually do that much. Show me how much you've done for Robocop. <laughs> well, I ain't got to talk about it. To... No, no, no. Well, no. you've done a lot more than me, so shall I say no, my bits right. and okay. then you can. No, no, no. no. Okay, you... okay, right, listen, right. It's a cult classic, it's from 1977. It was a play originally. It stars Alison Stedman, Janine Davitsky, Tim Stern, John Salthouse, and Harriet Reynolds. First of all, I want to just say there's spoilers, so anyone that hasn't seen the film and wants to see the film, watch the film, then come back to this after. I'm going to explain the plot of the film. Beverly and her husband Lawrence invite her new neighbours, Tony and Angela, around for a small drinks party, along with her divorced neighbour, Sue, whose 15-year-old daughter, Abigail, is having a party of her own. What starts out as an awkward, uncomfortable gathering soon reveals the darkness hiding behind the aesthetic qualities of the middle-class lifestyles, the anger, bitterness, sexual tension and jealousy all comes to the forefront of the party as the drinks start to take effect and the homely aesthetic is unmasked. Did you come up with that or did you copy Yeah, no, no, I copied that. <laughs> I added bits. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, I think it's good to actually have a little bit of a... A, bit, bit, a little rough thing of the yeah. plot. No, I suppose in fairness as well, this is probably the least known of all the films we've done so far. Yeah, but it's a cult classic. Well, even today... Um, I was at work and I mentioned to a woman at my work, said, oh, we've been doing Abigail's party. And she said, oh, my daughter done a scene from that for her theatre studies. Yeah. I'd be interested in listening to it. So, you know, it does get out there. Mike Lee himself isn't a fan of how he shot the film. He's proud of the play, but and I can see why, because of it's very sort of straightforward like aesthetically, just to look at the, like, the cameras. It's very sort of harsh lighting, basic shots. I mean, he's proud of the performance of yes. all the actors. It's, it's, um, including his wife. Including his wife, yeah. He's, yeah, he's proud of the performance. Um, it's just, I think, the lighting and the directing on some of the shots he's not happy with because usually he goes back to see his films, but it's mm. one of the ones he's not really like, revisited. He, he understands that it's really big, you know? Um, yeah, he knows and it's People got love cult. it. Yeah. yeah. Going back onto the cast quickly, for those who aren't as familiar with the names, obviously you know them all because you know this film yeah. well. Alison Steadman, who plays Beverly, she was in Shirley's Valentine, The Kingsman, and she played Pam in Gavin and Stacey. Yeah, she's, now, also, the, sorry, she's also in Nuts in May, which is another classic film of, of Mike Lee's, mm, where yeah. this shows what a fantastic actress she is, because if you see the characters she plays in Nuts in May, which we will do down the line, and see this character, you would never think it was the same actress. Mm. It is completely, completely different. I mean, this shows this shows how good she is. Tim Stern plays Lawrence, a short husband. He was in Santa Claus the Movie, one yeah. of the dwarfs. Yeah, A Bit to Victoria, which is a film with Ju uh, Julie Andrews. OK. Uh, Janine Davitsky... Now, obviously, seeing her later years, she's like the go-to sort of old sort of dopey crone woman, isn't she? She's the dopey look on her face. She was in Man is the King George, About a Boy, and Benadorm, where she plays, um, what is it, Jackie Stewart? Jacqueline Stewart, yeah. Jacqueline she's like Stewart. one of the swingers. There's the, there's uh, Jacqueline and Donald Stewart. Mm. She's also in my one of my favourite Mike Lee plays, which is Grown Ups. She plays Sharon. And um, that's a couple of years after this. I think that's about 1980. Oh, okay. She was in um, One Foot in the Grave as well. I think she was the neighbour. John Salthouse, who plays Tony, was in The Bill for 35 episodes as Inspector Galloway. He was also one of the bobbies at the cinema in American Wealth in London. Yeah, I know. I see that bit and I thought you're going to be... Ex I didn't realise you'd, you'd have noticed that bit. But, but he was... looks like he's one of the coppers because yeah. they've all got that shortcut beard and yeah. they're all that same... Stature. He was in The Bill as well. He looks like a copper, doesn't mm. he? He's got that kind of copper kind of face, policeman. And then finally, Harriet Reynolds, who plays Sue, was in Are You Being Served, Sorry and Lovejoy, and so, sadly died age uh, age 47 in 92 from cancer. Yeah. She was also in Ever Decreasing Circles. She was in a lot of like TV mm. sitcom-y sort of things, I think. She was brilliant in this. 
Yeah, Mike Lee was invited to lunch by Michael Rudman, the artistic director of Hampstead Theatre in North London, and his general manager, David Alkin. They had a successful run of shows and they had accomplished an unprecedented surplus. Under the rules of the theatre, if such a profit was made, they were obliged to give it back to the funder, the Arts Council of Great Britain. They offered him 10 weeks rehearsal and a cast of up to five. He wasn't really bothered about doing any uh, any plays. He was more into, into doing films and where he just moved in with Alison Steadman, they was married, they was going to try for a baby. So it wasn't really something he wanted to do. But they talked him into it. Anyway, it was something that he said that he thought it was just going to disappear. He said it would like sink without trace. He didn't think that anything was going to come of it. It was something he just he just put together. The theatre production was the exact same cast. The only difference was Thelma Whit uh, Whiteley. Uh, she was the original Sue. So for some reason, she wasn't in the film. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what the reason was. So Harriet Reynolds took over, which I think she done a fantastic job because she's she's brilliant in it, So I mean, I know that there's criticism about the lighting and stuff, stuff like that, but I don't think people really care about that because the performances are so good and you don't really notice it, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Maybe, I mean, I'll, I'll get to you in a minute because you might have noticed it more than I did. No, I did like it. And I noticed when I watched it previously for when we was prepping for family outing, how much you drew from it for family outing. Yeah. You know, it used clearly the same kind of uh, kitchen sink drama type thing, yeah. you know, a little snapshot. And it's just the, the interaction between the characters. The I was disappointed with my own performance in family outing. And watching this, it made me think, if I'd done it again, I would have played my character differently. Yeah. I would have sort of done some of my would, actions I differently. Have, I would have as well. So I can see how it can be very inspirational. And Mike Lee, despite his shortcomings of this, as much as he sort of pushes it away from him, it's important to what he went on to make. You know, he, yeah. he's a very successful director after this. This was his early growings, and you have to appreciate where someone comes from. They're not straight away making great films. Um, I'm not saying this ain't great. I enjoyed this a lot more than his later stuff. But his successful films like Secrets and Lies, Naked, Vera Drake, Happy Go Lucky, Topsy Turvy, Meantime, Peter Lou, these are ones which he is now known all around the world for. Right. These are ones where he's, he's had seven Oscar nominations, mainly for screenplays for another year, Happy Go Lucky, uh, Vera Lynn. Vera Drake. Vera Drake, sorry. Topsy Turvy, Secrets and Lies, which he also got Oscar nominated for a director. So at that point... It's like the rest of the world was appreciating how well he could capture real life, mm. realistic dialogue, what people were like. But if they went back earlier to ones like this, they would have seen that he could do that all along. Mm. You know, I've seen this. Uh, I've only seen clips from Grown Ups and Nuts in May. I've seen Mean Time, which is, again, one of his earlier theatrical films. That's right. got Gary Oldman and Tim Roth and Phil Daniels yeah. again in it. And you can see he's very early on, he knew exactly the kind of scripts he wanted to write. It's not necessarily loads of action happening in the film. And I actually think this might have done even better. Well, not so much better, but the heart attack at the end, I know it it's punctuates the whole thing at the end. It, it leads up to the heart attack. But I don't think it was necessary. You didn't need to have a heart attack. Yeah, but I don't think that takes away from it. I don't no. think it's really... I think you need... Because what I've found with Mike Lee plays, as I say, my my favourite Mike Lee plays are from like the late 70s, early 80s, which are Abigail's Party, Nuts in May and Grown Ups. Mm. They are fantastic films. And now with these films, what they do, what he does with this, he builds up the characters. It's very sort of very slow kind of getting to know the characters very like day-to-day -day kind of stuff mm. and then all of a sudden all these characters you get to know they all interact with this massive climax so there's a big climax at the end of each of his films where all these characters interact and you find that the same with secrets and lies and many of his other films that's what i love about him because he writes people he you get to know these characters and then at the end there's this big like explosion with mm. something happening, like Grown Ups especially. I love Well, I haven't seen Grown Ups, so don't tell me what happens. But we'll, 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 we'll be watching, we'll be yeah. definitely watching that, because that's one of my favourites. But that's what I love about Mike Lee. That's what I did take from when I was writing um, The Family Outing, is because I wanted to sort of write people, 
And then you can add little bits and bobs into it. And I found when I was doing it, it was just so easy to do. And that's when, that was the very first thing I ever wrote. Mm. Yeah, and I remember originally, this is kind of a spoiler for Family Outing. Um, originally, you was going to have one of the characters die at the end of Family Outing. Yeah, the character I played. Yeah, and I remember saying to you, I don't think it's necessary. Because you already had some big reveals in Family Outing. Yeah. And... It, the whole tone of it, it just brought it down a bit. And when watching this, that's what it made me think of. Yeah. I was thinking, if you had done that, it would have been almost the exact same I didn't tone film it in the end. I didn't film that. No, I'm glad it. you did. But I also need to revisit that film. I need to re-edit it. Because like with, like with Mike Lee, I need to go back to it and I need to just... Well, you it, say that. Down. I don't think you necessarily have to. Imagine if Mike Lee went back and said, no, I'm going to change Abigail's party and he cut loads of bits out of it. You yeah. as a person who appreciates it would go, why are you doing that? Yeah. You don't need to. It's, it's, you're always your worst critic, so you. I, I think twice. No, but I feel that I, there's something. There's something. This is like I, I. I do need to revisit it, and I need to have a proper look at it. And there is bits I need to change in it. Yeah, I think you'd be better off. You've done your Abigail's party. You should now do your grown ups or your nuts in May. You should now think of a new project. Think right. That's stamped in history. That is one of my early. That's my first film. Think about doing something else. You know, what do you mean I'm doing my uh, my? You lost me then. I'm, you've done your Abigail's party. You do family your outing. Morning. Imagine if family outing was your Abigail's party. Right. Right. Say so now you do your nuts in May, right. or you do so. your grown ups. Right. Do a slightly different story. Do yeah. something more of a homage to them. Yeah. You know, at the time this is interesting. I'm sure you probably knew this anyway. There was only three channels on British television. ITV was on strike, and BBC Two was affected by thunderstorms. So that night. That's why there's got so many people who had the opportunity. 16 million viewers. Which is amazing. I mean, you don't get 16 million nowadays for, yeah. because there's too many options. Yeah. Dennis Russo's song um, replaced Jose Feliciano, who, was, who they usually use on the stage, which took away, which I think would have been one of the best jokes in it, because originally Angela says... Oh, it's a shame he's fat or something in the film. In, in, the, in film, the film, but then Miss Russo, she goes, yeah, it's a shame he's so fat. She goes, yeah, but he don't sound fat, does he? Yeah, but the play one was even better because Jose Feliciano is blind. So in the play, she said, it's a shame he's blind. And she says, yeah, but he doesn't sound blind. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's it's just... The same thing. A, it's the yeah. same thing, but I think that's slightly funnier because how does someone sound blind? Fat yeah. people can sound yeah. different, but yeah. blind people, you yeah. think... But he doesn't sound blind, does he, Ange? No. no. <laughs> like, but, um, yeah, also the same with that. There was... Um, they changed the... There was an Elvis song. And they put it with a Tom, Tom Jones, Jones, a Tom Jones song, which is you know, it's not unusual, which is classic now with Abigail's party. And did you also know about the song "Love to Love You, Baby"? Right, well, I know. This. The, yeah, oh, the song at the it's beginning. Not the, it's not, it's the, not the one version, by Don, it? It's not the one by Don, Donna no. Summer. Now I never knew that. I always thought it was the Donna mm. Summer one. It was sung by Claire Torrey or Torrey, Claire Torrey. Because the uh, the Donna Summer one had been banned by the BBC because That's of right. the orgasmic moans. Yeah. So when they used that version, it was it was another. It was a singer, but I, I have always thought that was Donna Summer. Mm. I always thought it was the original version of it, so she's done a good job of it. So, Alison Steadman, she was pregnant at the time, wasn't she? Yeah, it? she was heavily pregnant, and that's another reason why. Because what it was, this play was so successful on the stage that they wanted to then continue it, but I think the doctor said she could only do another couple of weeks' worth of work because she was so heavily pregnant. Mm. And that's when they said, right, let's. I've got a studio free, let's make a film out of this. And that's why the film was made. But if you look at her, when she's walking around, she's sort of like holding herself. Holding her shoulders. She's holding her shoulders and she's holding it. It looks good because where she's, I think the way she's walking and like where she's trying to hide the pregnancy bump, but it it goes with the look. It's like she's trying to hold her fat in kind of thing. She's like trying to hold herself like a model. Like she's sort of holding herself in all the right places. Not fat, I don't mean, but holding herself up like by the way she walks and she glides across the room. Yeah, I think... Out of all of them, she stands out the most as yeah. the, the host, Beverly. But also, I I look at her. She is she's a monster, really. <laughs> she is a horrible, horrible person. Yeah, she really is, and she doesn't realise she is. Yeah, but she constantly putting other people down, talking over people, 
or go and, can I just t say about your lipstick? Yeah. Um, Alison Stedman based Beverly on a lady she knew at drama school in Essex, merged with a woman she saw demonstrating a makeup range at a department store who either knowingly or unknowingly humiliated a lady that she plucked out of the crowd from passing shoppers and telling her a watching crowd as that the lady had applied her lipstick very badly. So it's like, it's like that's yeah. where she got that from, and probably that's obviously that scene as well. Yeah. She's she's a believable person. They're all very good characters. But if you think when it went to film, they'd already done these performances a hundred plus times. Mm. So this had come from the stage. Same with Rocky Horror Show, because that had been on the stage. The majority of the cast was uh, that they'd done so many shows of it. So when they put it to film, they'd yeah. got the characters to a T. Probably the only thing they would have had to have done is tone it down a little bit, because obviously theatrical acting comes across different on film of to course. realistic acting. Because otherwise they'd have been projecting too much, positioning their bodies in a way as if there was an audience there, whereas they would have had to change it slightly. But yeah, regarding the lines, they would have known them inside out in their sleep, yeah. back to front. Angela also mentions that Tony played for Crystal Palace in his teens, which the actor John Salthouse really played for them in real life in mm. his teens. There's a photo on that box set you gave me of him Oh, as, is... as a footballer. Oh, OK, as... OK. And the play was over two hours. Obviously, they've had to cut it to 104 minutes but for, to fit the TV schedule. Do they still do the play now? Oh, the play's been... The play, it goes, the play is continuous. I went and see it with Mum, and I wasn't really pleased with the version. I think if you're such a fan of the film and the characters, they're so iconic mm. that when you watch someone else do them, I mean, the, the ones that we see, and you can ask Mum as well this, it looked like the person that was playing Angela was playing it like she was like a bit simple, really simple. Like, really like, oh, I don't know. Like, really over the top playing it. And I thought, you've just... Like, mm. she's a bit slow, but she's, you know, yeah, like... She's a bit naive. She's a bit and... naive, but she, the, the, this, the character played her on the stage, and I just looked and thought, that's really, that's a really bad mm. representation of the character. And I just didn't like it, because I think, if you're in love with a film and characters, I was really excited about it, because we sat there, the set looked fantastic. I thought, oh, Abigail's goes party. And I looked at it and I thought, no, it's not, I'd rather just watch the film. Yeah. It ruined it a bit for me. But it goes on continuously. There's so many different performances, so many different people. Was it like a longer? Was it two hours? Or was it was it basically a stage production of what you know it of the film? It probably would have been the original script, but I don't think I would have noticed. They would have added little bits into it because they well, probably would have had the original script. The yeah, off. there's a lot of time. That's, but that's what I'm saying. They probably would have had the original scripts from the, um, from the, original, uh, the original show. Mm. See, I found that with One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest because I really like the film. I yeah. like the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And we see was... that. You, you and Caroline took me to see that. Yeah, with Christian with Slater. Christian Slater was, in the, was the lead role. And Mackenzie Crook was playing, what's his name, Billy, the character, the, the young boy. Who, ends who played up... Nurse Ratched? Hmm. I can't remember. Was it, it must have been someone famous, I would have thought. I can't think who it was. But, yeah, I remember you taking me. It was quite good to see. It was quite, quite close to the front. No, it was. But I know we only went there because Caroline fancied Christian Slater, <laughs> didn't she? No, she didn't fancy Christian. She was a fan She of... loved him because of True Romance. Yeah, she That's loved it. True That's Romance. It. So That's anyone it. attached to that, she was really excited yeah. about. And also, me and Caroline used to go to plays all the time. I did, I didn't know that. Yeah, we see Tis Pity, She's a Whore with Jude Law and okay. Kevin McKidd. Um... I do like a good play, but it's got to be a, but this a good play. Well, we were doing theatre studies at college at the time. Of course. So we often had to go to plays. Mm. But other times we'd go, OK, we'll go see... There was a play called Art, which those of them I'd watch and I'd... It was OK. Yeah. But I'd always be thinking as a filmmaker, how would I make this into a film? Yeah. Now, with the One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the Indian chief... Yeah. They made him really dopey. Oh, right. oh I don't know. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Which, may have been what they originally intended with the, the original novel, but what I like about the film is they give him a bit more dignity. Yeah. He's not dopey, he's just quiet, because he's quiet, he's, he's reserved, he doesn't want to talk to other people. Yeah. Spoiler alert for One Flew Over the Cooker's Nest, when he does what he does at the end, yeah. it's seen as um, being more sympathetic. He's it is, doing it, it is done sympathetic. But the not film. on the play, on, oh, the, on right. the stage play... He was like, he was just a dope, oh, let me put a pillow on your I would say he's doing it out of love in the film. Yeah, exactly. You can see the emotion on his face mm. in the film. But on stage, he just came across as some big sort of dopey guy. Yeah. 
smothering Christian Slater. Yeah. Then he goes and picks up the water thing and puts it back down again. See, that's what ruins it for me with a lot yeah. of stage plays. When, when If it's something you really love and they ruin a the character straight away, you sort of zone out of it. And I think that's what I've done when I watched Abigail's party because me and mum afterwards when I went, she was like, oh, what do you think? Because she knows how much I loved, loved it because I think mm. she took me there for my birthday. And I was like, yeah, I won't know blown away by it and I thought I would be because it's an easy one to do it's a really good play to do mm. because it was originally a play it's all in one room like that's like with I think Family Outing would make a really good um, stage play because if you think about it it's all based in the same apartment yeah. you could have the off screen parts with the phone calls but the main of the main of the show that's what I that's what I think I was thinking a bit what? Abigail's party yeah. when I've done that scene, but when I've done the Family Outing because it was all in the same area yeah. You know, it's all in the same space. It was all in the same house, different rooms of the house, but it was all there. And same as Abigail's party. And I think I was trying to sort of emulate that in some sort of way. Yeah. Did you also know, yeah, the entire piece is improvised. Mike Lee worked with each actor separately to create a character with a history from birth to present day. Once the characters were fully formed, he placed them in a situation and let the action commence. Probably about 90% of each character was left unseen, which is why it appears Lawrence, Sue and Tony are preoccupied with things, but we never discover what they truly are, which adds to the tension. Do you think when Tony goes to... They go to the party, Abigail's party next door, yeah. don't they? Lawrence comes back without him. Yeah. And he's a bit sh shady about, well, you have to ask him. Yeah. And then Tony comes back. What do you think has happened at the party? I don't think anything... But I suppose that's the good thing about this. Everyone can sort of take what they you want from it. You can you want. interpret it in any way you want. Because he comes across to me, Tony comes across to me. I mean, they, none of the marriages look happy. No. But Tony, you can see the resentment. He he looks at that um, Angie. Angela. And when he goes next door, he's quite he's more open for going next door. He wants to go next door. So then Lawrence comes back without him, and he's almost like angry at him yeah as if what was you doing there yeah the only thing i can think of was possibly he was having a few drinks with like the girls and trying trying it yeah. up maybe he was doing he was that's what i'm saying you can you in, any way you, in any way you want can't you because then when he comes back in that's the only time you see that tony see a bit seem a bit sheepish yeah is when lawrence opens the door to him and you can see that tony's a bit like oh, is everything all right kind of thing and you can see he's sort of a little bit um, on edge thinking yeah. has stuff has this man who I don't know really Lawrence now blown the whistle on me yeah so I was uh, part of me was thinking I wonder if it'll come out but in a way like you said I'm glad that you don't that yeah. you can just interpret it that's yourself that's how you can yeah. interpret anything yourself Angela's cramp was in, improvised yeah from a stage one of the first productions when she was obviously on the floor doing CPR yeah which I've got cramp doing that before you know we do uh, CPR training we do yeah. first aid training so it's a position where you are likely to get cramp yeah. so when she gets up goes, ah, I've got cramp yeah. and Mike Lee was shouting carry on carry on yeah. and they ended up keeping it in it yeah because it's so funny and it I think good. it works well like because it. then their their end shot as it were they're all doing their different thing you look at sort of Tony and Angela and you think why are they together but what I think the backstory is that someone mentioned at some point that he was in hospital at one point she was his nurse so he sort of Florence Nightingale yeah type got a thing, got a yeah. kind of got a thing with her. She he got married. A lot of people just got married then days, didn't they? You know, got married, settled down, buy a house. Better. I also like the fact that at the end, when she is doing her job, that she is very dominant over him, and he sort of then he becomes and even Beverly. Yeah, hmm. she's telling everyone what to do, and. Yeah. it's like then all of a sudden you can sort of see that's when he has that bit of respect for her a bit more because then she's she's in charge and that Beverly even when her husband's dying she's making out as if it's his fault yeah she's sitting there with a cigarette going are you okay blowing smoke in his yeah. face <laughs> <laughs> and when she's saying like oh but he wouldn't go he kept going on didn't he he didn't he and yeah. you think what well, horrible that's when it, it cemented it for me she's the worst person yeah. she's a I've known people like her yeah I, I know and I know. It's, it's the actual absolute worst kind of people you can't stand them but, she but other people they, they they sort of almost like a vulture she she pries on these people, thinks, who can I get away? Blatantly, blatantly, blatantly coming on to the, yeah, the husband. To and she's Tony. going, 
Go on, you dance with Sue, like the little husband who's about five foot something. Yeah. Sue is like almost like six, six foot. foot and looks really uncomfortable when they're dancing. I just think it's so funny. And then there's Angela doing like the disco dance in the middle, oblivious to the whole... Um, yeah. the whole sort of flirting that's going on between Beverly and her husband. See, Lawrence obviously knows. Yeah, he can see. He, he knows been, her. He knows that's her. one of the things that drives him to his heart attack, yeah. really. His wife just sort of... I just think she's I think it's brilliant. Like, and Sue as well, the way she keeps making Sue drink more. Mm. She's going, another one. She goes, oh, no, no, I don't want another one. She goes, come, just a little top up, Sue. You know, like... Yeah. It's, it's, it's really well cast, really good characters. Very... Yeah, they're very fleshed out characters. Yeah. So that's what I love about it, you know, because each of them... Uh, add something to the to the to the play, yeah. to the film. Mike Lee says that with Beverly and Lawrence, they would have been so happy if they'd married someone else. Oh yeah. He said they. It's not necessarily that they're just rubbish at marriage, but they should not be together. Yeah. You know. But I just love. I think there's so many one-liners in this that people say every day. Yeah. You know, like people that are fans of this. They've got their own little language with their friends. I've done it with with people that have that are, that are sort of up to date. That people that know this film, mm. I've been like that with them. Like you say the odd little one liner, and you know that you're, it's a little reference to Have a Girl's Party. The same that I've done with grown ups or nuts in May. I think it'd be interesting if you had a drinking game for every time she says actually. Yeah. Because she constantly. Oh, I do think that actually, and yeah. actually, and she knows everything, and that's the thing. She's like such a, she's such a bitch because she starts going. So we got about asking about the divorce with Sue, mm. and like asking little questions, and then she says like with Tony goes, "Oh, let me see your footballer's legs," and she's like, right, yeah. groping his legs, and the husband's sitting there looking, going, he's just yeah. getting more and more wound up, and Sue, I mean, Angela, the wife, is just sitting there yeah. oblivious. To it. Did you also notice with her necklace? No. She's got this white tight little necklace on with a little heart, and each time she talks, the little heart's flapping up and down. Yes, it's so, it's so right. tight. She's got where I love her hair. It's like she's put the curlers in, but she's just like basically left it in that yeah. curl. It's like she hasn't bothered brushing it out. It's she's just, it's just really well. And cast. that Sue looks so sort of uncomfortable, uncomfortable there, yeah. and she keeps topping up her drink, yeah. constantly. And she's really so polite. No, no, no. Beverly knows how dominant mm. she is, and she can control these two because Sue won't say nothing, and Angela's. Not as clued up as her. I can hear music. Yeah, it's probably party. Cut the doors long. Yeah. So it's in, in reference to party, party yeah. yeah. So we can get away with it in this podcast. But I, so, what do you think of the film then? Honestly, honest. I know it's not your kind of thing, and I know it was something. When I chose it for you, I, when I chose you to watch it, I thought he's not going to like it. But I want to do all sorts of stuff, and I like. I wanted to do this film because it is such a cult classic, and. It still holds up today, and as I say, there is still plays of this. I think there's a play um, like this year. I think it's been it's been out. It comes out all the time, and it's always packed, and it always sells out because it's so popular. Hmm. No, I do like uh, films like this, and I do like this film. I like that it is so seventies, mm. and even with my criticism of the well, it's not so much criticism. My observation of how it was shot mm. and how Mike Lee doesn't like how he shot it. I prefer to look at it like, do you remember the uh, Inside Number Nine where they had the Christmas one? Uh, it was, and it was like the Krampus. 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 Oh, yeah. I remember that was shot very 70s TV style. Yeah. That's what it made me think of. And yeah. I think it is, it's so set in time yeah. that if it was one of those things that someone tried to remake and shoot properly, it would lose it. Because yeah. that was part of its charm, the fact that it was this 70s I think TV that's why you movie. get away with it. I think that's why, I mean, I've never really noticed it. I suppose if I was to look at it, mm. look at, apparently there's bits you can sort of see reflections in, her, in Angela's glasses mm. and stuff. I won't look for stuff like that because I don't yeah. want to look for thoughts in it. But like with the lighting and stuff, I have never really noticed it. If I look into it, I'll probably look and go, yeah, that's a bit light there. That lighting ain't that great. But as you said, it's like very, it's very 70s. Mm. So you can get away with it because it's in its own little yeah. bubble. Yeah. It's it's like if someone watched that Inside Number 9 and didn't get why they were shooting it that way, yeah. you could say, watch Abigail's Party yeah. because that is how things were shot, especially on TV in the 70s. But it, is, it feels really like you're in the room with them. I think yeah. that's also the way it's filmed because it's like that kind yeah. of thing. But her, her performance in this, mm. in fact, all of their performances are fantastic, but Beverly, um, yeah. Alison Stedman's performance in this is yeah. outstanding. I think, yeah, I think they're all done, um, they was all good, but if Alison Stedman was someone else who's just as good as them ones, it wouldn't have been as good. I think she elevates it like, a little bit yeah. more 
But it's important that it's her doing it because where she is the host of this party. Yeah. yeah. You know? But yeah, it's fantastic. Um, when I, I looked on IMDb and it got 7.9 on IMDb. That's decent. That's well, good. this is good. I looked on Rotten Tomatoes. There was no um, critics. Yeah. There's no critics reviewed because no. obviously I don't think enough critics have reviewed it. It's the first time I've seen that. But the audience was 82%. I think that might have been because most of the critic sources they go to be movie critics yeah and even though this is a movie it's yeah. also it's a, a TV, play it's a, a TV, tv movie tv movie because it was what is it play for today or something yeah there was a thing years ago in the 70s it was called play for today which i think um it was like each week or something i don't know 70s early 80s and they do a different play either it might have been each day or each week but it was similar sort of things to this and i think nazi may was a play for today i think grown-ups was a play for today mm. but they was very similar kind of storylines similar kind of like a play, basically, yeah, like a play put onto the screen. Mm. But yeah, this was this was um, famous. It was luckily the day that it was shown. I think that was the third showing of the film. Was that night where ITV was on strike, BBC Two had the uh, had problems with the channel because of a big thunderstorm, yeah. and BBC One was the only channel. So imagine turning the telly on, you only got one thing to watch. You sit there and watch it. But yeah. it that's what drew a lot of people in it became a classic because people loved it and it is a really well presented um, piece of film mm. you know it's, it's, it's an enjoyable watch because you're looking thinking what is happening here yeah. she's vile or this is funny or this is going to happen you're seeing all these things happen you're thinking how is this going to end mm. and I know you said with the end it didn't need a heart attack but I think it all just adds to it because at the end it's all just falling apart so it doesn't matter how it ends, as long as it blows up. I mean, it could have ended that he could have left, eh? or something could have happened. But I think that was just a good scene at the end. She's on the phone, tell Abigail to turn her music down. Abigail puts the phone down on her. Um, Angela's laying on the floor with her cramp. Abigail! Yeah, because she's put the phone down on her. She's told, oh. she's phoned up Abigail to phone her to tell her to turn the music down. She's going, right, Sue, tell Abigail to turn that music down. So she's like... Because then she's, like, being all bossy with everyone. She, start, uh, she starts to show her true colours at the end, like, mm. Beverly. She starts, you know, like, where she's a bit pissed and all that. And, you know, mm. but I just think it's fantastic. I, I yeah. always love it. And it's the, kind of, it's the kind of thing that I can dip in and out of all the time. But I love it because it's a cult classic. So I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. So you're... So, yeah, so you you, you ain't got the out with me for making you watch oh, it. Yes. Then. All right, it. you it's enjoyed it. Did Mum watch it, Mia? No. By, by, by just because timing. She, oh, timing. she was yeah, out yeah. doing other things. Well, she no, was I know up. she wanted to watch it. She was going to, but I only had two opportunities to watch it, and right. either time she was going to be there. Okay. So, yeah. Well, I'm really glad you enjoyed it then, Charles, because, yeah. I mean, I love it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I couldn't find... One thing I've been looking for, I could not find how much it cost and how much it's made. It would be interesting to know it how have much made, this is made. Yeah, the thing is, I don't think it would have made, if it didn't have a theatrical release, mm. it would have just been included in the BBC viewing. So right. it wouldn't necessarily be... But surely, with all the plays and all that, it must have earned oh, well, a lot plays, of money. Yeah, but again, it's it's, it's hard to stick a, a, a yeah. ballpark figure on how much something makes as a play. Yeah. Because you know? I looked around, I tried, and I just couldn't find nothing mm. for the... But I think I've got enough um, information for it. So, yeah, well, I'm glad you liked it. I mean, I love it, so. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, do you want to know what my choice is? How I get you back? All right, go on then. I can okay. see your little slimy little face that you're going to No, be. you'll like this one. Well, you had to look at it. You didn't even know. You had to no, look I in the book to see. To... All right, go on. Okay. Although I was surprised, as you said, you'd done Robocop the other week, and I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. But then when I watched Robocop, I actually really enjoyed it. So, obviously, I will have the same frame of mind when I'm watching this. Okay. I hope it's something good. <laughs> That's all I can say. Now, when you think 90s... Yeah. ...and serial killer, who pops to your mind? Hannibal Lecter? No, bigger than Hannibal Lecter. Serial killer? Freddy, Freddy Krueger? Bigger than Freddy Krueger. I can't think of 90s serial killer. Give me a clue. 1994. That's not a clue, that's a year. <laughs> I'll just tell you. Beverly Sutfin. Oh, Serial, serial. Mum. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Serial Mum, serial yeah, mum. good one. Serial yeah. Mum, I like I knew that. you had that on your horizon anyway. Yeah, but, that's a um, good film. What happened the other day, Lily was round and she wanted to watch some, like, cheesy 90s fun kind of thing. And yeah. we was going through the list. <laughs> and I see Serial Mum and I thought, perfect, we'll watch that and we can do podcast on it. Yeah, so. But did she like it? Yeah, she did. Yeah. Me, her it's mum, brilliant me, her and mum watched it and we all liked it. It's a brilliant it is, film. It's good. Brilliant film. But anyway, yeah, so Serial Mum. Okay, Serial Mum. Serial okay. Mom. 
Mom. Mom. Mom. Isn't it? Serial mom. Serial bitch. Right. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and we will catch up with you soon. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.